thank you, Father, that you care enough for us that you had an appointment for today. Father, you want to meet with your people. You want to be intimate with them. You desire an intimate relationship with your children. I thank you, Father, that you speak truth into us. Father, I thank you that you help us to recognize the lies of the enemy. And Father, I thank you that you have promised that we would hear your voice. You said that your sheep hear your voice and they will follow no other. This morning, Father, our desire is that our ears would be tuned to your voice. And that, Father, we would follow no other. That, Father, our intimacy with you would be wholehearted, unreserved, full passion for you, God. I thank you, Father, for your love for us. I thank you, Father, for all that you have done for us. And that, Father, your desire for us is amazing. I thank you, Father. I ask for your blessing upon the word. I ask you for your blessing upon the ears and the hearts of your people. That, Father, they would receive the revelation knowledge of your word this morning. And I ask it, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Thank you this morning for worshiping. Oh, praise God. Amen. Amen. You know, our worship team endeavors to lead you into worship. How many know you have to follow? It's your choice to step into what God has for you. Amen. If you would go with me to Mark chapter 1 this morning. I want to talk to you about the best offer. How many like to get the best deal? Amen. Don't settle for second best. We want the best deal. Y'all remember that game show, Let's Make a Deal? Um, some of you younger people may not remember that, but there was a game show and, and you would have something. They would give you a prize or you would have something and they would want you to trade that or at least consider trading that for a better deal. What's behind door number one or what's behind door number two? And what, what are you willing to give up to get what you think might be better? Well, this morning I want to talk to you about the best deal and how the enemy desires us to give up our best deal for his lousy deal. And so I want to encourage you this morning, don't settle for second best. Don't settle for third best. Don't settle for the first offer you get. I heard one, one gentleman said there are seven words that would change your life. And that is, is that the best you can do? Sometimes it's worth asking that question. Mark chapter 1, verse 9 through 13. Praise God. Mark chapter 1, verse 9, it says, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And he coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beast and the angels ministered to him. Now, if you go to Matthew, it's funny because Mark gives you two verses of the temptations of Jesus. Matthew goes into a little more detail, and that's what I want to look at this morning. I think it's funny that you get different persons and God uses them to bring out a different perspective. So Mark and Matthew have a little bit different perspective. But how many know whenever God does something in our lives, then the enemy is not far behind to try to steal that. So Jesus has just been baptized. God has just spoken that this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And guess what happens? He's taken out in the wilderness and immediately the devil comes to tempt him. Right away, he comes to tempt him. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. If you want to flip over there, we're going to be looking at this. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, now, you didn't get that mark. I said it was 40 days, but... 
How many know the gnats count too when you're fasting? <laughs> you get a little tempted. We didn't have to do that this morning, amen? Now, my job is to keep you awake after that big meal. We're very blessed. I was very honored. I was a little nervous at first when I found out Sunday school had been canceled without me knowing. But afterwards, I was like, okay, all right, that's, I guess that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> So he gives us 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was hungry. And you say, well, duh. After 40 days and 40 nights, you see his humanity. You see his struggle with the flesh. Verse 3, then when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus was being tempted to meet his own need by his own means. He had a legitimate need. How many know after 40 days and 40 nights, your body's going to be needing something? He had a legitimate need. But the problem was the enemy was tempting. He said, you need to meet your own need. Don't rely on God. Jesus, you have a need. You need to meet it. Satan was trying to use the need of Jesus' body to amplify the want to of committing sin. Very often I've found that the desires of the flesh will be used to try to double team my spirit when it comes to a temptation. There are legitimate needs that this body has. But we cannot be led by the need of our body. We're to be led by the Spirit of God. And here the enemy was tempting Jesus and he was saying, Look, your flesh has a need. You're, you're, you, you've mistreated your body. You need to take care of it. And here is a shortcut, Jesus... Here's a shortcut. Just turn the stones into bread and and you'll be fine. Jesus knew better. I know that there are sometimes when I'm hungry, uh, my mind will try to justify the reasonings for me to eat something unhealthy. And today is an extraordinary example of that. I can tell you I was not prepared for that when I, (laughs) I didn't know about that to start with. There are times, let me get a little more practical. There are times when I'm running late and I'm trying to get to one of my kids' deals. And I'm really tempted to press on the gas just a little bit more. You know, i gotta, I got to get there. It's my job to be there as a father. Therefore, it justifies me breaking the law. Now, do you think that's going to go over with the highway patrol or the sheriff's deputy that pulls me over? No. My need does not justify me sinning. If I really believe that God is leading me and directing me, then I can trust that I will get there when I need to get there. If I'm following the Spirit, I can trust the Lord in that. But my need does not justify me doing something wrong. It's important. The enemy does not come in with guns blazing. He prefers the sniper or the ambush method. Temptation is strategic and calculated. The devil did not tempt Jesus in the first week. He didn't tempt him in the second week. He waited until 40 days was over. Then the devil came to him. When he was at his hungriest, when he was at his weakest, that's when the enemy came. Darkness will try to use our flesh to destroy our spirit. Paul said that he had to keep his flesh under daily. Paul said in Romans that the mature Children of God are led by the Spirit of God, not by their needs. We can wait for the Holy Spirit to direct, not be flesh-led. Listen, there's nothing wrong with bread. Okay? There was nothing wrong with bread. The problem was when he wanted... Well, let let me back up and let me read it. Just I put it in my notes. Nothing is wrong with bread, but we have to realize that we are first and foremost a spirit with a body we are not a body with a spirit you are more than your body your body is simply a vessel to hold what's really really valuable and that is your spirit and your soul we are to be led by our spirit not by our flesh because our flesh is just a suit it's just the outer shell how many of you have ever and and here's well here's my deal I bought a little car, and it looked pretty rough. But I love that little car. In fact, I bought it for my daughter, but I end up driving it more than she does. 
And what I've found out is I love what's on the inside. I love that engine. It is fuel, fuel efficient. It, it works. It will get up and go when I need it to get up and go. The outside looks rough. And guess what? Guess what the value in that car is? It's what's on the inside. It's not the paint job. It's not the window. Amen? It's what's on the inside. You are the same way. Your body is important and you need to take care of it. But it is not the most important part of who you are. Don't let what's unimportant, maybe unimportant is not the right word, but don't sacrifice your spirit well-being for your flesh's comfort because that will always get you into trouble. Don't allow the enemy to use your flesh against you. Yield to the Spirit of God, not fleshly desires. Seek God, not the comfort of the flesh. It's a trap. Feed on the faithfulness of God. He alone satisfies. He alone satisfies. So the first thing is don't let your flesh lead you. Number two, Matthew chapter 4, verse 5. The first temptation didn't work. Jesus didn't give in to the flesh. Verse 5 says, And the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Notice this. The devil can quote scripture. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now let's remember back to Mark chapter 1 verse 11. What was it that God declared to Jesus? He said, you are my son in whom I am well pleased. What was it that the enemy was questioning? He was questioning his identity. He said, Jesus, you need to do something to prove who you are. If you're really the son of God, then you should be able to do this. But notice Jesus didn't have to respond. Because why? He knew who he was. The fact that God had declared it to him at his baptism was all that he needed. Listen, when God calls you by name, you don't have to prove nothing to nobody. God has called you by name. He knows who you are. You don't have to prove who you are in Christ. Now listen, there will be fruit come out. That's what the Bible says, that we will bear fruit for Him. But listen, when it comes to who you are, it's not based on what you do. You do based on who you are. That's what determines. You don't know what to do? Then go back to who are you. Because if you know who you are, then what you do will be a natural outflow. But the enemy is questioning him. God brings a revelation of who Jesus is and proclaims it. But the enemy comes in and questions. Listen, when God does something for you and he works in a miraculous way, the enemy will come in with his seeds of doubt. And he said, if you were really loved by God, why doesn't this happen? If you were really loved by God, this should be happening. Listen, God loves you. And it doesn't matter what circumstances are surrounding you. You are valuable. You are precious before God. Do not let the enemy come in and make you question who you are. You are a child of the living God. When you have accepted Him, that's the proof that you need because He has given you His Spirit. That's the proof that you're a son or a daughter of God. And the enemy will throw all kinds of good things. Look at where he took Jesus. He took Him to the temple. He took Him to church. And he said, now you need to do something in church to be really important. Throw yourself off and the angels will catch you. Listen, Jesus is going to come back from on high at one point. The devil was trying to get him to skip ahead. Jesus knew it's not the right time. And besides that, I don't have to prove to you, devil, who I am. I know who I am. That's the joy that we can have and the confidence in knowing who we are. My kids don't have to prove who they are. It's because they know who they are. They don't have to do something to prove it to me. Guess what? I know I was there when they were born. I know who they are. They don't look the same, 
but I know who they are. They don't have to do anything for that. Please understand what I'm saying this morning. You do not have to prove to God that you love Him. He knows your heart. He knows. Don't let the enemy tell you that you have to earn salvation or that you have to earn forgiveness or that you have to earn His love. He loves you because He was there when you were born. Praise God. Mark chapter 1, it says, A voice came from heaven. And I love this because it doesn't say this in Matthew, but in Mark, God is talking. God the Father is talking directly to His Son. He says, You are my Son. In Matthew, it says, This is my son but in mark he gets personal god gets personal with us the revelation that jesus was given at baptism was who he was and that's what the enemy came to question in fact he questioned it twice how many know sometimes the devil doesn't let things go twice he came to jesus and said if you're the son of god make these stones bread if you're the son of god throw yourself off the temple and jesus was able to resist both no sooner had the revelation come than Jesus, that Jesus had been given than Satan comes to try to cause doubt. Jesus had said in his parable of the seed of the sword that as soon as the seed is sown, the birds of the air come to steal it away. Mark and Matthew deal in beautiful detail of the Trinity and the temptation to question. Notice it wasn't just the voice of God that was spoken. The Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove. The Spirit, so you, only, you, you have a beautiful picture of the Trinity here. God says it, the Spirit descends on Him, and you have Jesus in the flesh. A beautiful picture of the Trinity, yet when you have the fullness of God manifesting at this baptism, it wasn't a day later before the enemy becomes and begins to question and cause doubt. Remember, Jesus is out in the wilderness now. He's no longer at the lush river. He's now by Himself. He's now in harsh circumstances. And it says he was out with the beasts. I know some of you guys like to go hunting. Nothing against hunting, but I'm not into wild beasts. Okay? I don't like to go. Some of you guys like to go out with the wild beasts. Not me. But Jesus was alone out in this unfamiliar place. In this place of dryness and aloneness. And that's when the enemy came to question who he was. If you remember, the same question was asked. Toward Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 it says now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made and he said to the woman has God indeed said I don't think it was by accident he approached Eve because men typically very logic I said I say what I mean and I mean what I say anybody amen with that do you say what you mean and mean what you say how many know women are not always like that? I have learned that through years of marriage that what she says is not always the full meaning of what she's trying to convey. So the enemy comes here to the woman and begins to question, have you really heard from God? Do you really know what he meant? Maybe God had a different meaning. Maybe he didn't really mean that about you. Maybe he was just saying that to you because you were with Adam. Listen, ladies, you are valuable to God, and what he says about you is the truth. Don't let the enemy question. Don't let your emotions cause you to question. God has said what he means, and he means what he says. I believe the woman was targeted strategically because, because the question is, did God really mean what he said? The question that Satan proposed was that Jesus needed to do something to prove his identity. And God's word was really not enough. We have been saved by grace, not by works, lest anyone could boast. I was told as a kid, don't take a dare. Listen, when the enemy dares you to prove who you are, all you have to do is say the name of Jesus. He is my brother Father is my father, and that is my family tree. That is my relationship. That is who I am. And devil, if you don't like it, you can take it up with the books. Go check the registry. I've been born again. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I have a birth certificate in heaven, and I know who I am. And I don't care what you say. I don't care what label you put on me. 
I am a child of the Most High. Get out of my face. And sometimes you have to be just that blunt. Don't be afraid to stand up for who you are. Praise God. Praise God. All right. Let me read you one scripture from John chapter, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. It's a beautiful picture. We, had a, a, we have a picture of this where there is, it's like the father's hand, and then there's a baby's hand that's reaching into it, and the father's hand is beginning to wrap around that little one. And it says this in John chapter, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. We are called His children. He loved us when we were unworthy. He loved us when we had done nothing. Yet He still loved us and He called us. And not only did He call us to Himself, but He gave us His name. He gave us His... Guess what happens when I pass away? All that I have will pass to my family. Why? Because they have my name. When Jesus passed away, when He died on the cross, that full inheritance came to us. Now listen, I don't know if my children know how to write a check. I know they know how to use a debit card. Guess what? They have access to all that I have. We have access to all that God has in Christ Jesus. We may not know how to fully use it yet, but we have that inheritance that has been given to us because we have His name. And I know I'm, I'm, I seem to be beating on a dead horse this morning, but you need to know who you are because it will determine your, sta your status when it comes to eternity. Just a simple side note. Remember, Jesus was in a spiritual place and yet the devil was still tempting him. Sometimes in places of worship to draw attention to ourselves, Jesus was tempted to jump off the temple to be saved by angels. It wasn't God's time. There may be the right thing, but don't settle until God's timing is there. Wait for His timing. Wait for His plan. It's going to come about. All right, the third temptation. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. And again, the devil took him up on an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things will I give to you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. The enemy will come to test your loyalty. He will set things in your life to see what is it that you really value. What is it that you make the most important? What is it that you say nothing else can be compared to this? Because Satan will come to see if you can be bought. He will come to see if there's anything that you'll give God up for. I heard a story. It was a story of a, a lady who was on an airplane. And she sat next to a businessman on the airplane flight. And they got into a conversation and they were hitting it off and they were both, both very pleasant. And, and um, the businessman actually propositioned the lady. And he said, look, I'm a, I'm a wealthy businessman. Would you have a rendezvous with me for a million dollars? He said, I will give you a million dollars for an intimate encounter with you. And the lady thought for a moment. She said, a million dollars? I'll be willing to do that. And then he confessed. He said, look, I'll be honest with you. I don't really have a million dollars. He said, but what about for $10? And she went, no way. What do you think I am? And he said, we've already established that. Now we're just haggling over the price. Be careful what you trade your soul for. Be careful what you trade the intimacy of God for. Because I guarantee you, the enemy is lying to you. There is nothing more valuable than God's presence. There is nothing more satisfying than being with your creator, the lover of your soul, the one who created you and has given everything. He has given what makes heaven heaven for you. It is Jesus that was given for you. Jesus is the one that makes heaven heaven. It's not the gold streets. It's not the river. It's not the pretty buildings. 
It's the fact that our Creator is there. The one who died for us is there. That's what makes heaven. Don't give Him up for something so trivial as satisfaction in this life. He is worth everything. Don't sell out to the enemy. His offers are never going to satisfy. And the price is always too high. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 says this. Then Jesus says to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it, is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? And I love the quote by Jim Elliot. You may have heard this. Jim Elliot said, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot gain. Excuse me, he cannot... Let me read it. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. This life is temporary. The things of this life are temporary. Listen, as much as I enjoyed the breakfast this morning, and I thank you so much for that, guess what's going to happen this evening? I'm going to get hungry. I'm going to want to eat again. Maybe I get some cake this time. Nothing in this life is worth sacrificing our intimacy with our Father. Listen, I understand that there's not every time that you can come to a fellowship. I know that there are things that get in the way. But listen, don't give up your relationship with Jesus Christ for anything. Nothing is worth giving up our soul. It's that precious. And He wants us. The enemy will try each area of our life Body, soul, and spirit. Jesus was tempted body, soul, and spirit. Because the enemy is looking to see, is there a window that's unlatched that I can get in? Is there a door that's left unlocked that I can get in? He'll see if we've, we've left something up for negotiation. Is there a way that I can wheel and deal? Jesus was offered the whole world. What did Jesus come for? He came for the whole world. But he knew that he would have to sacrifice his relationship with the Father in order to do what the enemy was asking. And that price was too high. He said, I will not sacrifice my mission and who I am to satisfy and take a shortcut on what I think would be good. I will not yield to that temptation. Don't ever negotiate. We don't negotiate with terrorists. We don't need, need to negotiate with sin. The deal is never good enough to give in. Joy comes in the morning. The temptation will pass. Hold strong to the rock who never changes. Hold fast to the reality of God's word. Though heaven and earth shall pass away, his word will remain. And he will remain true to his word. I want you to notice verse 11. Because after 40 days of temptation and hunger and fasting, of all the temptations that he went through, verse 11... Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. Even Jesus needed a time to get ministered to. You need to make sure that you are getting fed spiritually, that you are taking the time to nourish yourself, to take care of yourself. Make sure that you are allowing God to speak into you. Please pray for our Sunday school teachers and our Wednesday night uh, children's leaders. Because they give and they give and they give. And we need to make sure that we are investing in them. I love the fact that once a month, the kids come in here. Not just that I get to see the kids and the kids come in and fellowship with us. But the teachers get to come in and be a part of this fellowship. I don't want the kids separated on a permanent basis. We're not just trying to get them out of the way. We're trying to instruct them on their level. But at some point, they have to come and be a part of us. Because we are the church and we're working this together. So make sure that you are nourishing yourself. Take care of yourself, body, soul, and spirit. Nourish your spirit. That's the word. That's worship. That's fellowship with other believers. Nourish your soul too. Laugh. Enjoy what God has given you. Recognize 
the beauty of the people around you. Appreciate who God has put into your life. Let your soul be nourished. And obviously, we need to take care of our flesh. It's our instrument. That's what gives us the right to operate in this world. Take care of your body. Okay? There's nothing wrong with eating something sweet or something nice once in a while. But make sure that you are balanced and taking care of the temple that belongs to God. Amen? Praise God. Remember who you are this week. The enemy may come to you this week and present a temptation to you. Do not give in. Remember the value that will come when it's all said and done. We're going to be blessed in God's presence. Praise God. Hold fast to His Word. Would you bow with me this morning? Father, I pray, Lord, this morning that Your people have heard. I pray, Father, Lord, that they have heard Your voice. That, Father, that they are valuable. That You have called them by name. God, that You, you knew their name before their parents did. And then, Father, that you have a plan and a purpose for them. And it's not to use them up and mistreat them. God, you take care of your vessels. And I pray, Father, this morning that you would work in hearts. That, Father, this week as the enemy comes, God, that you would bring to remembrance the Scriptures. God, that we can resist the devil and he will flee. I thank you, Father, that you have spoken truth to us. And I pray, God, that we would hear your voice above all the other voices that are out there. And that, Father, as the temptation comes, that we would recognize what you have written about us in your word. Plans to prosper us and plans to take care of us. And we don't need to settle for second best. God, I pray this week, God, that you would empower your children to stand for truth and stand for righteousness and do what is right, even when it's tough. God, may your spirit angels minister to your saints this day. God, give them the courage to speak truth and love. Help them, Father, to confront evil and to speak truth. Help them, Father, to be empowered from on high to accomplish your purpose. And then, Father, we would lift one another up and encourage one another and to support one another even as we see the day approaching. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. We look forward to your return. I thank you for it this morning, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Be blessed this week. Know who you are.